The conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. Hello, everybody. You just heard the words of President Dwight D. Eisenhower in his farewell address to the nation, coining that magic phrase, the military industrial complex. This is all by way of me introducing another Chapo movie episode. And we got a good one for you. Uh, this is the one we've wanted to do for a while. And, you know, longtime Chapo listeners will probably be aware that I think second only to Martin Scorsese's Casino, this movie is maybe one of the most referenced films in Chapo history. I think it's safe to say. Safe to say. It's, it's high up there. Yeah. You might remember such classic hits as, you don't know shit, Mr. Garrison. That's because you were liberal and never been fucked in the ass before. <laughs> And triangulation of fire. See, that's the key. That's the key. Fun and games. Um, we are, of course, talking about Oliver Stone's conspiracy masterpiece, JFK. I you, believe newly relevant in the era of Q. You know, around the time this movie came out, around it's like after that, its first circulation on uh, premium cable. Three young boys all watched it. Oh, yeah. Separated by geography, the class race one of them <laughs> one of them was known as jewish but actually if you look at certain theories descended from genghis khan <laughs> uh they all watched it and they all thought damn this is so true yeah how did this get out there it's true and we were the uh you know spoiler alert it was the three original hosts of this show and you know we were the only people under 40 who watched it and felt that. <laughs> that but wouldn't you know it, we came together to form a show. The reason we started the show was because we all believed the extremely specific conspiracy theory and still believe it yes. in Absolutely. the movie JFK. Everything in JFK is correct. Yeah, JFK was killed by gays. Yeah. <laughs> the gays killed because of Kennedy. I remember watching it on VHS, and it was so long it's a that double it came v- on yes. two cassettes in, in a Big chunky box. The Godfather. Yep. The Deer Hunter. Yep. The right stuff. Mm-hmm. JFK. Those double VHS. Yeah, Rodney box Dangerfield's classics. Nutty College. <laughs> all the classics. No, and the, the three original of the hosts of the show all watched this film independently one of another, and then came together to create something magnificent, much like David Ferry, <laughs> Clay Shaw, and Leon Harvey Oswald. Yep. To we do did something it, fam. special, and. Uh, you know, to as a preface to the discussion in the film, I, I think what is so fascinating about JFK is, as like a film, like as a, just like a piece of cinema, it is so flawlessly done and executed at every single level: the acting, the directing, the cinematography, the editing, the music, like everything about it. Uh, it creates just such a Thoroughly compelling and, and it seamless tapestry. Spell. It has one of the all time best casts of any movie ever made. It is stacked from top to bottom with god tier performances. We will get into each of the like stellar, stellar casts and cameos in this movie. But like I said, what makes it such an interesting film artifact is because, like I said, at every single level is a masterfully executed piece of cinema that nonetheless portrays a narrative. That is an absolute travesty. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is completely insane, but it didn't stop me from being a kid and drawing little boxes on my note paper in class connecting LBJ <laughs> to the CIA and the mafia. I'd be like, this is how it worked. My God, they did it. That is the least surprising thing you've ever told <laughs> yeah, me about holy your teenage shit. years, Matt. <laughs> I wish there were video games around when you were a kid. Like, <laughs> there were. I just didn't play them. The video games I that were that around. Instead. The video games that were around when you were a kid it was, you know, like the initial Mario games and then things called like Quest of Zagon. 
<laughs> so like nothing as immersive as CS 1.6. Yeah, not at the time. Video games where you move a dot through a maze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry that my that the bad video games left me with no other alternative than to solve the murder of the president. Yeah, I see. Like I um. I love this movie for so many reasons. The first of which, because it's like, I feel like ideologically it's a relic that I've been thinking about like this type of liberal, the Oliver Stone, Ted Turner liberal. And it's like, I think like if you're listening, maybe a few of your moms or dads were kind of like this. They were people who, they were boomers who they lived through all this incredible social change, lived through Vietnam. uh, But they also lived through like the destruction of, the idea of execution of power in the American liberal mind, but they, their distrust were in the right places. Like they implicitly distrusted like the intelligence community, finance, all the, all these things, but they just had no idea what to do about it. And because they had no like formal economic or power critique, they would come to these absurd conclusions that were like, Oh, we should draft George Bush to fight in the war. <laughs> or like, you know, there was a bunch of evil gay guys who killed JFK and guys who absolutely hated the CIA, hated every president, but were like, yeah, do I one vote for Bill Clinton, please. <laughs> and that's like, you don't see a lot of that anymore. Like the Hollywood liberal now is so fucking dull. Compared well, they're to just this. complacent. They're just, they've de- totally embraced the idea of, 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 rel- of neoliberal capitalism as, as like the end state of social and cultural uh, evolution and like we all just need to get on board and and what are you complaining about like they don't have that sense of aggrievement that like the ex hippies did i mean okay so like what makes this movie fascinating is like yes it is about the jfk conspiracy which is like the ur godfather yeah. of all american conspiracy theories and it is fascinating to watch this movie now in a new age where like Everything is a fucking conspiracy theory. Yeah. Like fuck you, Epstein, 9-11. We just like we live in an interconnected web of so many different overlapping conspiracy theories. And like the thing is, they're not all wrong. No. As we've established on the show. And the narrative that Oliver Stone uh, presents in this movie is also not all totally wrong. No, as well, but like that's what makes it compelling, is yeah. it's this deft mixture of total left field bullshit. It's complete conjecture and then just shit that's like that's weird isn't it that was weird that that happened <laughs> yeah. lee harvey oswald just went to fucking russia he renounced his u.s citizenship and then just came home two years later with a russian wife and they're like yeah that's cool you learn a lot in your early 30s <laughs> <laughs> just a kid from new york <laughs> he, he was, was just the harvey oswald york. literally was just a kid from new york <laughs> Through, through my eyes from the book depository. <laughs> this is k- Killing the President, the biggest audition of all time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Oliver Stone's JFK follows the, the real life criminal case brought the like the only the only actual homicide case you know brought against people for the assassination of John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, no, sorry, John F. Kennedy by New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison, who is played in the film by Kevin Costner, uh, and, and you know a portrayal of steadfast, upright, very Henry Fonda. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah, a Henry yeah. Fonda type role, like the or Gregory Peck. Yes, in, in, very uh, much. In, um, yeah, in, yeah, Atticus Fitch. All yeah, the way. To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, wh- and what's fascinating about this movie, like I said, it, it, Matt, like you have pointed this out, is that the essential narrative that Stone creates in this movie is the one-to-one template for the QAnon conspiracy. Which is why they have... That's why you might wonder, if you're a normal person and you're looking at QAnon, you're like, okay, this is weird. And I guarantee you the thing that baffles you the most is John F. Kennedy Jr.? Where the fuck did he come from? And this movie explains why. Because in the Q cosmology, yeah, like this movie was made by a dinosaur liberal in Oliver Stone. And because they all died out, because all of our own liberals all died out, that now the only people who respond to that narrative are the Q right, like the, the sort of the, the, the lump in American reactionary, because in their mind, JFK was when everything went to shit. The yeah. death of JFK was when America stopped being America, when you got rid of the, the, the leave it to beaver, white picket fence, like a, a white American middle class country. And, and everything that's come after that is all 
a result of the death of JFK. And that's why they bring JFK Jr. in here. He's he faked his death so that he could come back and then poison George H.W. Bush in his hospital bed to punish him for killing JFK, because that was the original sin that created this weird multicultural globalized America where jobs are going away and being replaced by fentanyl and all. And, 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 you know, there's, there's uh, all this gayness on television and shit like that. Like every like mingled cultural and economic grievance, uh, all of it started with the JFK assassination. And this movie has that ideology. Like it didn't even know it was doing it, but it ended up creating uh, the, the Q mindset because it's, it's JFK wants to go up against the elite who want us all to go to war uh, and, and they kill him. And that ushers in this era of chaos. I mean, the movie starts on the day of the assassination and then there's a five year. Well, we need jump. to begin. We need to begin like uh, it, it begins like immediately after like, like yeah. minutes after the shots ring out right. in Dallas. But before that, it begins with this uh, mon- a montage of like a stor- a mix of historical footage and, you know, actual uh, film things. And it, the, the first voice you hear in the movie is Eisenhower's farewell address. Then it begins this 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 montage narration narrated by Martin Sheen, another lion of American. Yeah, uh, Martin Sheen, who narrates, uh, and like, and, and this is like kicking off the movie is maybe the most ludicrous part of Stone's thesis because it kicks up with Martin Sheen, the voice of like the you know just this mellifluous voice of like you know uh, trustworthy, yeah. fatherly. Um, you know, Jebediah Bartlett himself telling yeah. you, and it portrays Kennedy as like, I was reading it here, it says, November 1960, Senator John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts wins one of the narrowest election victories in American history over Vice President Richard Nixon. And then he goes, uh, was it alongside his beautiful, elegant wife, Jacqueline <laughs> Bouvier, the symbol he became is that JFK is the symbol of the new America of the 1960s, signifying change and upheaval to the American public. And it sets up this idea of you know JFK, this young guy, hot wife, beautiful family. One word, hot wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, that yeah, yeah, represented you know the new frontier, civil rights. Uh, you know, like the uh, ask not what you can do if we go, we will go to the moon. Yeah. You, you know, uh, our civil rights and this idea the that like frontier. you know, hey, uh, yeah, the new frontier and oh, like and oh, we're gonna we're gonna bring peace to the world and end the Cold War. Okay. That is maybe right off the bat. That is the most horseshit part of this movie. The setting up that the JFK administration yeah. was like uh, the hope and change administration, because by every actual historical account, JFK said a lot of things about civil rights, but absolutely dragged his feet on that. Came from a fanatically right wing anti communist family. Um, was absolutely persecuting the Cold War with as much vigor as those who came before him, and. Uh, then he talks about like you know uh, he was uh, basically uh, pushed into doing the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion by the CIA. That was a failure. Then the Cuban Missile Crisis, and then of course Vietnam begins. He sends the advisors over. That begins to you know ramp things up. And then you know Martin Sheen tells you like um, he was getting ready to bring the troops home, like JFK. At, while he was escalating American involvement in Vietnam, yeah. which, you know, to be honest, had been going on at a very low since level Eisenhower, since yeah. Eisenhower. Yeah. But um, as he was ramping up American involvement in Vietnam, the film tells you immediately he, he was also planning to stop all of that. Yeah. So he's, uh, you have Kennedy, his beautiful, beautiful smoke show of a wife, hot wife, his beautiful kids, and civil rights are on the horizon. Civil yeah. rights. Uh, ending the American military involvement in Vietnam that um, he actually also kind of escalated and started. He's going to stop that. He's going to seek, uh, you know, uh, a rapprochement with yeah. Khrushchev, blah, blah, blah. And then Dallas, yep. November 22nd, 1963. Wave to the people, Jack. <laughs> they love you. What was it? What's the line? It's like, no one can say that Texas uh, doesn't love you. Yeah, the Dallas. Mrs. Dallas. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Connolly said, you can't say that Dallas doesn't love you, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> And then the shots ring out. His fucking wig gets <laughs> flies off like a fucking frisbee. His, his wig got split. It's true. Um, and that's where the movie begins. Yeah. The movie begins. We see Kevin Costner, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison in his office. Someone bursts through the door. Oh my God, boss. They shot the president. And he goes, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> not, not the president. I uh, needed him. And then a... Uh, 
Interesting though, what I do like about it is like the you know they go to you know this is back when like there was like one TV in the city of there was yep. three televisions in the city of New Orleans. Everyone's packed into the bar watching it. Some people are crying, and then what I like about the movie is like have the people in the bar like good riddance to that goddamn liberal. Yeah, <laughs> they should give him a medal for killing that son of a bitch. Yeah, all like a very specific type of fat that you could be in the sixties, like where it was just. We don't have this type of fatness anymore because of fluoride, soy, and sugar in the water. <laughs> but it was just like it was like comic book fat, where you were just like you, you were like, like a barrel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you were like Fred Mertz. Yeah, you were like every fat per like they everyone looks like Donald Trump now, <laughs> just like flapping in all directions, fat in weird ways. And our fat guys used to just be like big joyous balloons <laughs> like the guys in this movie. And those are all the guys who watch the Kennedy has been killed and gone. He deserves a TWA airline ticket to hell <laughs> as that airline still exists at this time. And then, okay, and then we, we, we see, um, you know, good liberal Jim Garrison. He goes, I'm, I'm ashamed to be an American today. Like, you know, shocked, horrified, mourning with the nation. But then we introduce Guy Bannister, <laughs> played by the great Ed Asner. Oh, so good. And his um, just... Stumble bum rummy friend played by Jack Lemon. Two amazing roles and performances. Yeah, Two is, just top tier actors. You yeah. see Ed Asner playing Guy Bannister, who is a very real and important figure in JFK conspiracy lore. Yeah. He was a, a retired, I'm going to put that in quotation books, private investigator working out of an office in New Orleans, who we'll get into it, was intimately connected with. Uh, you know, the mob. Retired they, FBI agent. Reti oh, sorry, retired FBI agent working as a private investigator in New Orleans who was running this office in New Orleans that Lee Harvey Oswald spent an entire summer hanging out in yeah. uh, that was connected to all of these, like, Cuban exiles and, like, you know, what is absolutely, like, an act active intelligence operation. For sure. Um, mm -hmm. So we see, uh, you know, yeah, just grotesque, alcoholic ogres <laughs> Sitting there, and, and, and as there goes, he's like, the man, they're crying for the man like they knew him. Makes me sick. <laughs> and then he just goes, takes his drink, and goes, here's to the new frontier, Camelot and smithereens. And then I love Jack Lemon as just his like dumb alky friend. Go, no, 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 and uh, uh, Guy Bannister gets drunker and drunker to the point where he just pistol whips Jack Lemon. Why do you know what I want to look through your files? Gee, I've seen enough here this summer already to write a book. I always like my files. You're the only one here today. What do you mean? Huh? What do you mean you've already read a book? Well, no, I mean, well, do you, do you know what I mean? We've seen a lot of strange things here. Strange people. For he's like, why well, have you been looking at my files? Yeah. You've been looking at my files, and he's like, well, I don't even look at your files. I, I've, seen, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of things here. There's someone enough to write a book. And he goes, what are you talking about? You question where your loyalties are. At. Uh, pistol whips him. So like immediately, you, you see like the, the, this vein of like this ugly right wing uh, undercurrent to like the the uh, in contrast to beautiful handsome Kevin Costner, who's like you know. Again, upright, steadfast, heterosexual. Yeah. Yeah. This is another type of guy we don't have anymore. Just like two drunks that hated each other, one that feared the larger one. <laughs> this is, you know. But they always hung out. Yeah. They had yeah. no Be other friends. Before computers, like these guys <laughs> shoot, like, um, instead of wasting their time in like YouTube comments and like being like, Greta Thunberg's a Jew or whatever, <laughs> like they're like, the just like let me find a smaller man who I can hit with my gun <laughs> while we both get drunk all the time. It was sort of okay. This is the missing link, or the hot couch person is the missing link between these guys and the modern oh, loser. Oh shit! Damn, that's true. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, New Orleans, uh, and then of course as this is going on, Leo Harvey Oswald is immediately arrested at the movie theater, like an hours after uh, killing the police off Dallas police officer J.D. Uh, Tibbet. JD Tibbet. Uh, he is immediately arrested, charged with the murder of J.D. Tippett. And then, you know, soon after that, they're like, this is the guy who yep. killed uh, the president. And then, like, I don't know, a day later, walking out of a Dallas, the Dallas uh, courthouse through the parking lot, 
Oswald! Blah, blah, blah. Jack Ruby plugs him in the chest, kills him. And that, when we were watching that movie, like you pointed out, like that was like not only was the president being assassinated insane. Imagine that happening right after that yeah. happened on television. On television, because the Kennedy assassination was just a thing you heard on. TV. Nobody no, saw this. Nobody saw this film, film, film much later. Decades yeah. later, it was in the vaults of Time Life. But that happened on fucking TV. Dude's walking out of the courthouse and he just gets popped. I mean, by about- a by a, again another. Stumble bum loser rummy fucking nightclub owner a mobbed up nightclub owner played in the film I get just every role every role stacked. Stacked. one of the best castings Dude, I've Jack ever Ruby seen. played by Brian, Brian Doyle Wilmer. Murray yep. so fucking good and then also did Jack Ruby showed up in an earlier press conference the, he corrected the one. one of the other reporters on the name of Oswald's uh, organization in New Orleans. Because right. he said it's the hands off Cuba thing, and he goes, "That's the fair play for Cuba committee." Apparently, that also this was real. Happened. This is like all on TV. Yeah, right. So then the, you see, like the guy who uh, assassinated the president is then assassinated on television. <laughs> I mean, think about how you think about when you woke up and uh, Epstein was dead. Yeah, imagine if that shit had happened on television. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and, I, and especially I just, at a time when everyone there was only TV and there was only one channel. So okay, we've got. Ed Asner, Jack Lemmon, Brian Doyle, Murray so far. Lee Harvey Oswald played uncannily by Gary Oldman. Honestly, a brilliant unnerving. killed it. Brilliant Absolutely performance. And, he, killed and somehow it. he looked exactly like him. I don't know what they did, but he looked exactly like yeah, Lee Gary Oswald. Oldman is so fucking good at this movie as Oswald. And much of the movie is shown in flashbacks where, like, you know, Oswald, uh, Oswald gets shot right there. But much of the movie unfolds in flashbacks through a brilliant editing technique where, like, it, through montage, like, all, the only action in this movie are people talking to each other. That's the crazy thing. It's a three hour movie that's all people talking in rooms. But. Stone directs it so brilliantly, but like while people are having a conversation, he cuts in flashbacks to the things they're talking about that literally animate the things and action that they're yeah. talking about. That, like I said, propels uh, the plot, no matter how ludicrous or like the the idea being advanced, in such a convincing way. It like, shows you how powerful a medium film is, uh, like like as a narrative device. Yeah. So, D. A. Jim Garrison. Uh, begins to uh, connect Lee Harvey Oswald to New Orleans because uh, he lived there as a teenager with his mom and apparently spent the entire summer of 1963 there uh, walking around handing out, you know, hands off Cuba flyers, yep. but also suspiciously spending a lot of time in the offices of a uh, right wing lunatic, uh, an ex FBI agent, Guy Bannister. Yeah, odd. Uh, a strange belt fellow. Then uh, they get a tip that a person, a certain person named David Ferry, was also new and had connections to Lee Harvey Oswald. David Ferry played by Joe Pesci in another unbelievable performance. David Ferry, another totally real and bizarre person, wore a ludicrous wig and fake eyebrows. (laughs) Yeah, he had alopecia and he had fake eyebrows and a wig. Uh, They were like drawn on like with markers. Yeah, and he was a defrocked priest who'd been kicked out of the of, of the priesthood priesthood for being gay also a pilot who worked for the new orleans mob and had cia connections as well uh and this is also true lee harvey oswald as a teenager was in david ferry's like civilian air corps it was like the air, it was basically like the boy scouts for, for airplanes, airplanes yeah. yeah uh okay so then like they they bring in David Ferry to, you know, question him about, like, you know, why he drove, drove to Houston, like, the day of the assassination. And he tells this uh, ridiculous story that makes no fucking sense. And then they're like, we're going to detain you for more questions, David. I find your story, frankly, unbelievable. Then the, uh, they detain him, turn him over to the FBI for questioning. The FBI immediately releases him. Yep. Then the movie's like, well, life goes on. Then it just cuts three years later. Gar- Jim Garrison is on a flight from Washington with... Classic New Orleans, Louisiana politician Huey Long. No, oh, uh, not edit, Huey Long. R.I.P. Huey Long. This is Russell Long. Russell, Russell okay. Long, who was a senator from Louisiana. I believe his nephew. I believe he was Huey Long. Uncle nephew. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> That's some real Uncle played Magic, by right? Walter Matthau. Walter this motherfucking movie has Matthau. both of the grumpy old men. <laughs> is this like the gr- like? This has to be like some of the greatest casting ever. Like this is. An all-star cast. No, that's every single role stacked, like, absolutely stacked, and f- ultimately for 
one of the most insane interpretations of the JFK conspiracies we've ever seen. Yeah, and people were like, sign me up. Every Everybody in uh, Hollywood was like, I will be in this movie. So three years later, Jim Garrison is on a flight with uh, Russell Long. Huey Long's son. Huey Long's Ooh, son. Okay. okay, there we go. Russell Long, played by Walter Matthau, who like, as they're just slugging scotch on a flight, you know, <laughs> yeah. because you do their... Basically, red pills him about the JFK assassination. Yeah. He's just like, you know, you're telling me that boy made that shot. Like that that dog won't hunt, boy. Like <laughs> in all his like, you know, uh, Louisiana love his aphorisms, and uh, he just basically. And then there Garrison's was, just. The like, Warren Commission was picking that shit out of pepper. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know what that means. Yeah. I have no idea. Is that good? Uh, he's, you know, you tell me he made that shot. He's like his Marine buddy said he's got baggage drawers. You know what that means? It means he was no good. And I'm like. No, what? I love how you <laughs> like. I, that's my favorite part of the dialogue is like he knows that Garrison has no idea what the fuck <laughs> that expression is. So he's like, "Ooh, I've got a, I've got a eight hour flight with my friend, the district attorney. I, ooh, you got to, you got to impress him, Russell. Ooh, there's a cool term that the Marine said that you can imply to him that he know that you know and he doesn't. Uh, then you can explain it to him. Oh man, that was the life. Just any time you did anything, it was like. Yeah, could I have 17 drinks, please? <laughs> <laughs> no, but crucially, at like this three-year jump in time from 1963 to 1966, the first thing that uh, Long tells him on the flight is like, these hippies are everywhere nowadays. Yep. I saw one that's pregnant as the daylight. You know what was written on my stomach? Love, child. And Matt, you pointed this out. Like, this is crucial to the film because it's saying that like the Kennedy assassination created... Yeah. Because like the, because he's talking about the hippies, and then they're not talking about Vietnam. They're talking about the hippies. And then Garrison goes, I always felt like things were different after Kennedy was killed. Right. Right. Like, it's not just that they went into Vietnam, although the Vietnam thing also fits into the modern right, because in, 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 at, at, when the movie came out, like, the idea of being anti-military, it was all, that was owned by the left. You know, this is post-Cold War, right? Up, fucking Persian Gulf. All the right was like, hell yeah, America, come get it. We're, run, we're running this shit. That was in the era when it was like, the Cold War's over. We're going to take over the world. Now we're in retrenchment mode. The, the frontier has retreated. And now everyone's paranoid about being overwhelmed by MS-13 thugs and, and ISIS sleeper cells. And so now empire for, for like regular right-wingers, you know, like regular, the kind of people who make up Q as opposed to elite ones, uh, the U.S. military involvement is... Uh, viewed very hostily because we need those guns here. We need them on the border. We need to be protecting what we have because we know that the days of expansion are gone. And so that's another element of the movie that at the time read as left wing. And now it's part of the Q narrative of these, these elites, these triple parentheses and, you know, limp wristed elites. They want to send your, your kids off to fight, die in other countries instead of protect what we have here. Yeah. I mean, it, you know how everything ultimately goes back to Turkey, right? Of course. <laughs> um, I guess, like, if I had to equate this and all sort of contemporary conspiracy theories with anything, it would be, like, how more religious, more conservative members of Turkey's uh, body politic see, like, the deep, the original deep state, yeah, the Turkish, Turkish one. Deep because state. it is... Like a lot of it's well documented, the insanely creepy, murderous, illegal shit they did. And it's also well documented, the absolute insane theories people like Erdogan have had about them. Yeah, because I mean, and, the, the, the modern, modern Turkey was created largely with the help of the CIA through Gladio and stuff. And they were doing coups every t 10 years. They were just up oh, time for a coup. So I th this is something I've been sitting on a lot. I think it's unavoidable that America, we are. Get to start, we have started and we will continue to contract as an empire. And you, you can go in a couple directions when your empire collapses, right? You can be like, oh, well, well, you know, that was fun, but I guess now we should provide like a very, very basic social welfare system for people and like just try to collect dividends on our spoil, our old spoils and do this sort of softer colonialism throughout the world where no one yells at us. Or you can go in the Turkey direction, which is just insanity, like blaming every enemy external and internal for why you no longer have an empire, but also so drawing back most of your state violence is now directed at home and to countries that are immediately closest to you. And this movie, I guess, 
as funny as it is and has as good of a time I had watching it, uh, and QAnon to the same extent, as funny as it all is, it does scare me to an extent because it does, it's so reminiscent of that. Yeah. And it, right. it's like, well, if these people win, we're just going to be Turkey. That doesn't seem fun. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, we got some sort of down home, uh, like cracker Erdogan to just coalesce all of like the surly lumpen Americans. Well, that's the thing. Erdogan is a cracker. Yeah. Erdogan. No, is he like, is. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, that's that's what's crazy. Like Erdogan is so he's like literally like if one of those people who's like. I've been put in the Twitter gulag <laughs> was like actually sent to prison <laughs> and then like won elections. It's so fucking weird. But like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So Garrison gets red pilled by Russell Long on a, on a flight where they drank 18 scotches together. Yep. And then he gets back to New Orleans and then he immediately starts pouring over the Warren Commission and finding all the multiple actual really bizarre inaccuracies and huge red flags in the Warren Commission report. Which, and what I love about this scene is like he's, you know, staying up late, like just inveighing against his wife. Like, how does it make sense that they didn't even interview this witness? <laughs> his wife in a totally thankless, pointless Ooh. role. She's good, but damn. Uh, played by Sissy Spacek, yeah. another absolute Amazing. like A-list fucking level talent but in the most thankless role in this movie oh. like one of the best examples of like the textbook utterly thankless woman wife character yeah. and what i love about this is that like she just starts going like honey that, that was three years ago we've also tried so hard to put it out of our heads like why are you bringing this all back up and i love it because it, it is so epstein shit i know virgil got in trouble for saying girlfriends hate talking about the epstein conspiracy but it's like i was watching that scene and, like i was just, like literally imagining her say but honey, the New York medical examiner ruled that that was a suicide. What, <laughs> why, why do you have to bring this all up? You, you sound crazy. My favorite thing she says is literally like when he starts getting into Clay Shaw, when she goes, she basically just goes, but he's nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like all the work he's done restoring the French Quarter. <laughs> yeah, like literally she's like, oh, he renovated an old building. Like it's like <laughs> you... you I know that, yeah, she was a real person and she has a name in the movie, but they might as well have just cast her as, like, dumb woman. Yeah. Because <laughs> she's just... I mean, she has to be there to represent the home and hearth that he's protecting. Yes. But her... And her, host, and he, and her hostility is, shows the sacrifice that he takes on that he's willing to, to suffer to do this. And, but it does really be like, women should really stay in the house. And also, like the original Kennedy montage in the very opening of the movie narrated by Martin Sheen that underscores what a, his hot, beautiful wife and yeah. perfect family. Early in the movie, they also established that like Jim Garrison, she, he's like, he's like, oh, you going to put me to bed, honey? He's like, oh, I'm going to come up later, honey. You know, yeah. you know, you know what's coming for you. Yeah. And it's like they just established he fucks his wife. Yes. Which yeah. becomes crucial <laughs> In a contrast with the targets of his investigation. <laughs> so he tells his office and like, you know, the, the investigators and a fellow attorneys who work for him. And, a, and again, another great scene where they walk around downtown New Orleans and go to the real office and show that there were two addresses leading to the same office. One of those used by Lee Harvey Oswald to go to Guy Bannister's P.I. Yeah. And then they've already interviewed David Ferry and they begin to uncover like the like the, these connections the wit potential witnesses to the Kennedy assassination David the, and their connections with Oswald David Ferry Guy Bannister obviously Oswald Jack Ruby but then this shadowy figure Clay Bertrand and they begin to try to figure out who this Clay Bertrand guy is and there's a great scene where they walk around like I said downtown uh, New Orleans they talk about like that building right across the street CIA Office of Naval Intelligence that right there that's the FBI we're standing in the heart of the intelligence community in New Orleans, if you were like a you know committed uh, you know uh, Cuban Marxist agent, like would you spend a lot of time here? Yeah. And you know uh, again another actually true fact uh, the uh, true fact stated uh, the the hands off Cuba flyers that uh, Oswald was handing out did have an address stamped on it, which was Guy Bannister's it's office. It's true. That's a fact. That's yeah. not made up. Okay. And so that's weird. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, this movie, so it's like there's so much real shit in there. It's like what the fuck. Yeah, the the ratio that like the I guess if you were gonna put like real shit as uh, proof like you would in a drink, <laughs> it, the combination is so interesting because it's like every tenth thing is like is like wait what the fuck wait oh that really happened whoa whoa are you serious like yeah the the guy Bannister thing the office being there uh, Oswald just 
being fine, not even really getting debriefed after defecting to Russia. Defecting yeah. to the yeah. Soviet <laughs> Union all, 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 and bringing his right. r- Soviet citizen wife back to America with him. And then, But then it's... The rest of it, like the rest of the the rest of the liquid in your beer, is, you know. Oh, and by the way, uh, this guy that David Fair knew also gay. <laughs> <laughs> gay guy here, gay guy there. They were being gay together. Well, they, they were having gay sex the moment that Kennedy died. And guess what? Their accountant also a gay man. Their mom and dad, gay men. Their kids, gay men. Their dog, gay. Everyone involved in this. Well, Felix. You're right. So, like, uh, they decide, Garrison is like, I decide I'm going to reopen an investigation into the murder of the president. And which circles around, like, these, these figures in New Orleans. Uh, crucially, this guy, Clay Bertrand, played by Tommy Lee Jones wow. in a magnificent also, performance. Also, if you see pictures, another one where it's just an uncanny, uncanny resemblance. resemblance. Um, I, maybe my favorite performance in this movie, Tommy Lee oh, Jones. Absolutely. Oh, God, yeah. he's, he's so, so good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Clay Bertrand, aka Clay Shaw, uh, was like a you know New Orleans uh, businessman and was was connected to the CIA. Um, you know who was like a classic sort of like Southern archetype of sort of confirmed bachelor, yeah, sort of like some sort elegant of debauched dandy. old Southern aristocrat, yeah, Southern dandy. mansion. And they find out about him through <laughs> one Willie O'Keefe, who I think is a composite character yeah. played in the movie by. Kevin Bacon. And if you've ever played the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, you should have a proviso that you cannot use the film JFK yeah, that's because cheating. it is it is the master key for winning every time you play that game. Yeah, it's too easy with it. Kevin Bacon somebody. plays a, uh, a, a hustler, a French Quarter hustler, who they go and interview in Angola at the farm. And in a great scene, like, you know, he unravels his, like, he tells them, he's like, uh, he's like, I got no reason to lie to you, Mr. Garrison. Bring all those motherfuckers on with their degrees. I'll tell them, well, I got nothing to lose. I don't need this parole. Uh, they interview him at Angola, and he, you know, he spins his story about um, that he knows who, you know, Clay Bertrand, who is a guy he met, uh, you know, as a, you know, member of the homosexual underworld. Yeah, exactly. And that, you know, he, it, it, you know, attended dinners and, you know, parties. And uh, he goes, yeah, he walked the limp, but don't get me wrong. He's not one of these limp wrists. <laughs> he's a Butch John. You know, you could put, go fishing with him, play poker, and he'd never snap, you know? Uh, and then this is where, like, again, like the investigation into the murder of the president becomes an investigation of gay sickos in New Orleans. <laughs> yep. Well, that's the, that's the final, that's the final cue thing. That's the final cue puzzle thing where this, because it's not just the, these, these, these elites are, are, you know, killing our president and, and getting us involved in foreign wars and leading to cultural decadence. The elites themselves are debauched perverts doing unnatural acts. And this, this like connects to fucking uh, Pizzagate and everything. This is like a, a milder, like, like boomer, you know, like a liberal version of that. Like these are sickos. Like the people r- ruling us and, and con- controlling things from behind the scenes are confirmed sickos. Because it's not just that they're gay, it's the way that Stone portrays them. Okay, yeah, they're, they're they're gay. Which leads to gay sex with each no, other. Which le- it's beyond yeah. that. Which leads to there's a scene like uh, where he where um they finally figure out that Clay Bertrand is Clay Shaw, as yeah. an alias of Clay Shaw, a guy who is a well known figure in New Orleans. Like I said, he is a, a philanthropist and like you know, like a well known man about town. And he brings him in, um, uh, Garrison brings him in to interview him. And like in that, again, through this amazing montage flashback technique, uh, he's like, have you ever met Willie O'Keefe? And he goes, well, I do declare I've never met such a figure. <laughs> and he goes, do you know who this man is? And it's Lee Harvey Oswald. And he goes, Mr. Garrison, you have me consorted with an awfully colorful cast of characters. It also right. says that this company is linked to the Slumber J Tool Company here in Homer, Louisiana, which helped provide arms to David Fair and his Cubans. <laughs> Mr. Garrison, you're reaching. Am I? But like in this flashback monologue where... Tommy Lee Jones, Clay Shaw is denying his involvement with all these people. Stone is showing you what's actually happening, which is that uh, Kevin Bacon, Joe Pesci, and Tommy Lee Jones uh, attend parties where uh, they do poppers, uh, paint themselves in gold paint, dress up like uh, sort of uh, French, French, aristocrats. French aristocrats, watch Triumph of the Will, and uh, do like S and M gay uh, yeah. orgy fucking. There's they fucking a, suck each other. There's even a moment where Pesci twists. Pesci's dressed up like Louis the Fourteenth or Louis the Sixteenth, and he and uh, uh, Tommy Lee Jones is painted gold like fucking uh, Apollo or something, 
and he twists his nipples, and then the on the audio track, it's like an animal roar. Oh. Yeah, like it's portrayed in such like like a like a Lynchian like yeah. slow mo like nightmare. It, exactly. It is like even though you could say like what it's just people having it's just gay guys having a gay party. It is portrayed. <laughs> <laughs> it, and you know, like you might watch people do that and be like, oh cool, go off. But it is not portrayed that way. It is portrayed in a way that leaves no doubt that this is wrong, that these well, people are perverts. The fact that they're uh, screening Triumph of the Will as they're doing it. And well, can you can separate the art from the artist? <laughs> but, you know, in the scene where they're, they're interviewing Kevin Bacon um, in Angola, um, like, you know, Kevin Bacon says, he's like, he's like, you think this is about justice? You think this is about justice? This is about order. Who rules? And he's like, the reason I'm telling you this is like, you know, people got to know. They got to know why he was killed. And he was killed because he was a communist. <laughs> Richard Nixon would have been one of the great presidents. <laughs> and this motherfucker Kennedy stole that election. And I just hate to think that they blame it on some dumb Oswald, <laughs> don't even know shit about what's going on. And then like, there's this whole other thing where like, uh, I think the, the guy Willie O'Keefe is based on was a real person who testified at the actual Garrison case. I think his name was Russo, I think, yeah. who, t- who testified... That you know he attended a party at Guy Bannister's office that was like filled with these insane Cuban exile guerrilla guys who, again, even after the Bay of Pigs, were um, you know had these camps in the middle of the Louisiana and Texas, like Louisiana swamps and like Texas fucking sticks, where they were stockpiling arms and being trained and like you know plotting a second invasion attempt after the oh, yeah. disastrous bay of pigs this is all real they called and it operation mongoose operation mongoose was real um it was you know again through cutouts the fbi knew about it but like it was also managed by the mob mm-hmm. like funded and you know like facilitated by them to a large degree um and like they they're all having a party at you know uh, guy banisters of these insane cubans and then uh dave ferry like that gets drunk and just starts ranting about how they're going to kill kennedy <laughs> and that's when he sets up the whole idea he's like you need three mechanics triangulation of fire but the crucial thing is that one has to be sacrificed <laughs> and then tommy lee jones goes he's like you have such a vivid imagination mr ferry it's one thing to engage in badinage, but you could say something that could so easily misunderstood. Right. And he punches him in the balls. And then he squeezes his nuts really hard. <laughs> so, yeah. Then it becomes a story about Jim Garrison, upright, heterosexual man, yes. investigating this sort of heinous, seedy underbelly of the homosexual the deep homosexual state. homosexual underworld. The gay deep state and all of their connections <laughs> So like the CIA, the, mil- the military mafia, industrial complex, yes. the mafia, all like these are the people yeah. who, who carried out the Kennedy assassination. Yeah. They're the reason that, uh, that Ellen DeGeneres came out. <laughs> <laughs> it, it'd be impossible to discuss every single detail in this movie because it's about three hours long. But like, you know, as, as the case advances, you know, uh, you know Garrison uh, further alienates himself from his family. Uh, and his poor wife, who just doesn't want to hear about it, he skips Easter services and brunch to interview sicko Clay Ugh. Shaw. And then, and, you know, as it goes on, they find out their offices are being bugged, blah, blah, blah. It becomes harder and harder for him. More and more people are telling him and the people around him, like, this is crazy. You're out way too far on this. you got to stop. Then really gets to what, in my opinion, is really the climax of the movie, oh, which happens yes. about two-thirds of the way through it. The climax of the movie happens when uh, Garrison goes to D.C. to meet an anonymous source who's like, you know, I've got the goods for you. Played by Donald Sutherland. Booyah. Hired because he talked really fast. And he needed to because he fucking has a lot of information to dump. And he meets this guy who calls himself X in Washington, who is a former high-ranking colonel in military intelligence, who says... You know, I won't tell you, you know, who, who's after you or why, but, like to, but I'll can fill in some of the details for you. But all it's nice to say, you're close. You're very close, Mr. Garrison. Now, he I want to talk... He's now, based on a real guy, by the way. I want to talk a little bit about the real Jim Garrison. Because I love the idea that, like, yeah, the New Orleans district attorney meeting with, like, some anonymous army intelligence guy who's like, you're very close. Follow the clues. The real Jim Garrison was a rather colorful southern character who is actually uh most famous for his prosecutions of vice in the french quarter and accusing judges of uh, racketeering with limited success 
So I just like the idea that like this guy was like almost close to blowing it all open. Uh, but the guy, the guy, Mr. X is based on a real guy. Uh, L. Fletcher Prouty was his name. Uh, who he wrote a book about how Kennedy was killed by the deep state. Uh, he claimed that Edward Landsman, who was a, a high-ranking uh, uh, counterintelligence guy, actually coordinated the assassination. But he's played the guy General Y is is yes. based on Edward Landsman, uh, and and he was a real dude. He wrote a book about it, uh, and he also uh, ended up uh, accepting awards from like anti-Semitic organizations <laughs> because at the end of the day, if you're conspiratorial. It kind of eventually has to go to the Jews, doesn't it? You got to have some explanation, like the where is this group? You know, if it's not a broader thing, if it, if it's if it's a small group, it always ends up becoming the Jews, or in the case of this movie, the gay Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and then again, in a, a uh, as already Lang as already said on uh, on Larry Sanders, you know who runs this town? The Jews. No. The gay Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Kevin Costner and Donald Sutherland walk around um, uh, D.C. and Donald Sutherland lays out one of the great movie monologues. But even if we had not allowed the bubble top to be removed from the limousine, we would have placed at least 100 to 200 agents on the sidewalk without question. I mean, only a month before I doubt you and Ambassador Adlai Stevenson stood on and hit. There had already been several attempts on De Gaulle's life in France. We would have arrived days ahead of time, studied the route, checked all the buildings. Never would have allowed all those wide open empty windows overlooking Dealey. Never. We'd have had our own snipers covering the area. The minute a window went up, they'd have been on the radio. We'd have been watching the crowd, packages rolled up, newspapers, coat over and out. Never would have let a man open an umbrella along the way. Never would have allowed that limousine to slow down to 10 miles an hour, much less take that unusual curve at Houston and L. Fantastic. He just spun out with all of this you know, flashback footage where he basically tells him, you know, we've expanded out. It's no longer the weird gay mafia in New Orleans. This is now the entire uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Lyndon Johnson, the Vietnam War, Bell Helicopter. You know, like it goes on and on and on. It's brilliantly directed. There's a brilliantly framed scene where they're sitting on a park bench with the Washington Monument behind them. Uh, Chris pointed this out in this movie. It's hilarious because they're sitting on a park bench that is somehow the only park bench on the National Mall. It's also in the middle of a hill. <laughs> It's not, like every other park bench I've ever seen in my life is right off of a sidewalk. Like you're walking and you go and sit down. You have to like go up half the hill to sit on this solitary thing, but it gives you an amazing view of the Washington Monument right behind them. It's kind of a perfect uh, microcosm for the whole movie because, again, as you said, the sequence is so like kinetically directed and it just swifts you, whisks you along. And it's this great montage that includes both actual archival footage and recreated footage that's kind of like all seamlessly interwoven between. And you're really caught up, and then you take one second to look, and you're like, "Wait, are they on a?" park bench in the absolute <laughs> middle of an unoccupied field in the middle of the mall and you're like wait none of this makes <laughs> any sense at all that i do love that scene because it is like that scene i remember that scene deeply speaking to me as oh a was kid. a teenager i watched yeah. that i was just oh, like you feel like the my world mind is being was revealed blown. Blown. not well not just not just that there's beyond that beyond how it's shot beyond like this guy's revealing the truth that character the donald southern char character is was so cool to me as a kid because it speaks to like a liberal fantasy and a specific fantasy for this type of liberal, which is like, yeah, but there's like a good guy in the deep state. There's like a nice man in there. <laughs> I'll tell you everything. Which is hilarious. Doing. Which is hilarious because to burnish his credentials and be like, wow, this guy really knows what he's talking about. He talks about how he had personally and in military intelligence been responsible for like uh, Arbenz in Guatemala, yeah. uh, Mossadegh in Iran, rigging the uh, Italian elections, fixing the elections, Italian elections in 1948. And he, uh, you know, he goes, mm, "We were good. <laughs> we were good at what we did, Mister Garrison." But then he finds this out, and he's just like. Gay people killing the president? <laughs> <laughs> this is a. I know, sir. I cannot well, it's abide a, this it's any a longer. It's a British -ish thing. It's those manless Sharkarkanos are to assassinate foreign leaders, <laughs> not ours. Yeah, 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 exactly. And what he was saying is just like what I realized is that they were applying black ops <laughs> right here in America. No. And it's just like, oh, no. Who would have thought? This, was, <laughs> this is like a very. I want to pinpoint this sort of thinking had a, it was a nineties thing. It, every few generations, it's like in the liberal mindset of like the good CIA will prevent the bad CIA from operating in America. It's, so, yeah. it's such an interesting idea because it's like you implicitly like know what they do is bad, but you're like, 
Yeah, but like they don't do it here. <laughs> it's like it's in not a liberal, but it's in some Tom Clancy shit. It's like I don't know, I don't know what spurs it, but it's a constantly like reoccurring trope and sort of like liberal oriented fiction. And it's it, it's interesting to me because it is like you do have this implicit guilt where it's like, well, I know that like something burnishes my my lifestyle in this country being the way it is. I know that it's bad, but like hey, at least it's not here. Um so like yeah, this, to me like this this is really the climax of the movie. And it, you know, when I remember when I saw it was a kid, this was like, you know, the, the most stunning jaw-dropping thing. The veil had you just like the veil has been pierced yeah. and you're seeing now like, you know, what America truly is. And the the case that X Donald Sutherland advances in this brilliant monologue and montage is that it is no longer about you know, like uh, like the, the mob or these angry Cuban yeah. psychos or whatever, that the Kennedy assassination was a literal coup d'etat pulled off by the military because they wanted the Vietnam War, uh, the CIA because Kennedy was, you know, supposedly going to Destroy remove... It, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was going to deeply hamstring their ability to operate and transfer... Uh, foreign intelligence operations to the Pentagon mm -hmm. and, you know, Lyndon Johnson himself. And there's a scene where they recreate where it's like a literal smoke filled room. And they're like, he's taking the goddamn advisors out. We got to do something about this. And Johnson is just like, I want some, you get with McNamara goes over there. I want you and him like stink on shit. And then like, or it's just, there's a scene where the, in that montage where uh, Lyndon Johnson, he's never like said Lyndon Johnson, but it's obviously him yeah. goes, get me elected. I'll get you your war. Yep. And this idea that, you know, he like basically was the handshake deal. Like, I want to be a president to do, and let's be honest, the things that Kennedy absolutely wasn't going to do as president, i.e. the Voting Rights Act, <laughs> Civil Rights Act, yeah, great and society. the Great Society. But in exchange for, I will I will go to war in Vietnam. Yeah. Which honestly, which honestly like, is like not. Well, that's the thing. It's like with all this, all this conspiracy stuff. It's you're, you're taking real contours and then you're trying to like make a narrative out of it because that was the devil's bargain of the Great Society. The, the it was yeah. the idea is you 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 could not be that like domestically radical without reaffirming your anti-communist credentials and the only way to do that is to fucking you know make a stand in south vietnam yeah and what makes this movie this movie is the idea that well i mean he didn't need to do that because jfk was doing all that already <laughs> he was actually doing a better job he was making the perfect society <laughs> <laughs> um i want to see like i'm very interested to see how we will see jfk in like a hundred years, and I the before, film or the president both. No, <laughs> before you ask, I do plan on living that long. But uh, no, the 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 president because it's already he already has such a weird image. Like for a while, right wingers have loved him. Right? Yeah, no, they, yeah, they're all like he'd be a Republican now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, which is true. Uh, he didn't know run, he, he didn't run to the right of Nixon on national security and on a tax cut. You know, Tony Soprano loved him, <laughs> but yeah. he had his hat. Uh, yeah, but it is. But like the more the more time goes on, the less of an idea anyone seems to have of what he did or believed or any of his policies even or even anything he ran on. And in a hundred, is he just going to be this deity, this symbol of like, oh, we could have been this? Well, clearly, because we already it's not even what seventy years later, less yeah. than that, and they've already there's already a cult around his son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I mean, hot guy who goes to Trump rallies. I mean, you know, that's sort of a recurring theme in Western civilization is a small group of, of people suddenly deciding to worship the son of God. So after, the, you know, this brilliant uh, montage and sequence with Donald Sutherland where he like lays bare the, the scale, the magnitude of what's really going on here uh, is the climax of the movie. But it's also when you watch it now where everything completely falls apart, in my opinion. Because basically at the end of all of this, Garrison is just sort of dumbfounded. And he's like, I can't believe this. And he goes, I never knew what a threat Kennedy was to the establishment. <laughs> and at that point, I'm like, bye-bye. I'm checking out of this yeah. movie entirely. Probably one of the most establishment people to ever live. <laughs> the bluest of bloods. Yeah, that Kennedy was such a threat to the establishment that they had to do this fantastically contrived coup d'etat to install Lyndon Johnson as president and like keep the CIA and the war in Vietnam going. And again, like this idea that Kennedy was de-escalating the war in Vietnam is, I think based on what you said, Matt, like one memo. Yeah, there, the one, there's one memo that was a drawdown order. But uh, people have argued, I think persuasively, that that was part of a cycle of, because they, they would uh, rotate out 
some of the advisors, and then they would rotate in a new batch. And yeah, he gave a, he gave a memorandum ordering a withdrawal, but I mean, he got killed, so you can say, well, yeah, that was the you first. You say whatever you want. Right, yeah. but you could also say just as persuasively, if not more so, well, yeah, if he hadn't been killed, then there would have been another memo sending in new advisors. Well, I mean, the, I, I but those think... are the advisors who knew how to end the war. <laughs> they were going to advise the South Vietnamese to stop fighting. To surrender, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a, you know, it does show such degeneration because it's like, at least of that, it's like, oh, well, there's the word, like, you know, drawdown. And even though it, it probably wasn't what, you know, these people who lionized JFK think it was, it's like, I could see why you would think that. But now, like, for QAnon, like, Trump will tweet out, wonderful big Sunday and they're like oh that means he's going to kill John Brennan <laughs> and again yes from like the, the opening montage narrated by uh, Martin Sheen to the one Donald Sutherland does the entire conspiracy the entire like theory of this movie hinges on this idea that Kennedy was a transformational figure in American politics and society and was going to fundamentally alter the, yeah, the military industrial complex. He was literally going to bring peace on earth. Yeah. As as Sutherland says in the thing, he was going to end the Cold War in the second term. He, he, <laughs> his, he was going to bring peace on earth and end racism. <laughs> like those were his <laughs> That was his re-election platform. We, we, the racism shit, we're done with it. <laughs> like, that's literally, oh man, that's fucking awesome. And it's just basically the evil forces in America, you know, could not abide that. Yeah. And they had him killed and then covered it up with a warrant commission. And yet in this world, because he finishes his speech and then the next scene is them serving the, uh, the arrest warrant on Clay Shaw, implying that, yes, this deep state that successfully murdered the president in front of everyone. And covered it up. And covered it up. We're going to get him by charging this guy. Like, what? They never say. But, like, what even was the theory here? Like, all right, you get a conviction on Clay Shaw. What? He's going to be like, I'll give up. the. You're going to flip him all the way until you got Lyndon Johnson? Is that the theory? I love because they charged him with a unnatural acts yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah, the only way I'm getting on this, getting out of this gay charge, is if I snitch on Lyndon Johnson <laughs> and Alan Dulles. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all just gonna like what? You get them in front of a jury, and they're all like, they all just you just get them all in jail, and then they're all they're all like one after the other in jail. Yeah, if we keep him in jail away from gay sex for a week, <laughs> he'll just flip on Alan Dulles. Like, okay, so these guys killed the president, but they're like, uh, we, we, we can't get this guy out of this sodomy charge. Killed dozens of other people to cover it the up. The movie also strongly implies that many of the witnesses interviewed uh, by the, either initially after the investigation or by the Warren Commission were just assassinated yes. as well. Well, that, that's, what's, that's my favorite part. Like, everyone, everyone is killed, but, like, for some reason, the greatest DA ever, <laughs> the only truthful man in America, like, they never... The clo- they like fuck with him like twice, but they don't. They never really like just. They could just roll up on him and shoot him. <laughs> like they could, they could easily do that, and they just don't. Well, because they know, you know, they don't. They, I guess they didn't want to martyr him, Felix. Yeah, that's I was true. looking into the real uh, Jim Garrison trial. Awesome guy. Of, of 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 Clay Shaw, and I sw- I, I'll have to check this. I, I swear to God, I think Jar- Garrison used the phrase "homosexual thrill killing" to describe. <laughs> <laughs> the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Yeah. I, I I didn't kill the president for any conspiracy or like ideological reason. It just I want to got my calm. dick on hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just cracking poppers, was, killing the president. The real Garrison was legendary con man. Oh yeah, I mean legendary. incredibly corrupt. Yeah, uh, total well, piece of a, shit. These in New Orleans. These in New Orleans district attorney and politician. Yeah, it's like it's like if it, it's like if a. If a carny uncovered the Epstein thing, <laughs> like that's the, well, the thing is, is that a carny's actually, way more trustworthy like than Oliver New Stone, Orleans DA. I guess he wants to be like kind of well, I'll give him their due. So there's actually kind of a head nod in the direction of his notorious corruption because uh, uh, one of his investigators, played by Michael Rooker, finds out who Clay Shaw is from a mob guy, and then at the end of the scene, the mob guy goes, "You gonna help us out with that grand jury thing?" And it's just sort of like left there. It's like, yeah, they're they're doing uh, they're doing corrupt stuff, but. At the end of the day, they're going to fucking stop this. Another, this is too far. Another piece of brilliant casting and cameo. The real Jim Garrison also has a cameo in this movie playing 
Earl Warren, for, head, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and Governor of California, and head of the Warren Commission. That's they have G- Jim Garrison play Earl Warren in this movie, yeah, which excellent. is also funny because when you see what the real Jim Garrison looked like, and then you realize that they cast Kevin Costner <laughs> to play him, it's like if they had cast a guy who looked anything like the sort of bug-eyed lurch figure that he looks like, he's sort of... In your, your instinctive trustworthiness for how morally upright his would be a little bit harder yeah, to yeah. wander. It would, I think, like more hagiog. It's more of a hagiography, like more than like making him look like not a con man is making him hot. <laughs> like that's yeah. The because re- obviously he was very old in that scene, but even young, he was not a looker yeah. by any stretch. He looked like a wall-eyed kind of yeah. like yeah. fucking thing going Fish on. Face. Yeah. That would. Yeah, that would he be had the Insmith look for sure. That would be a cool movie though. Like it's like how the real American Sniper movie about just the guy who was in the seals but lied a lot and was insane would be cool. The real Jim Garrison movie would oh, yeah. fucking rip. Just this fucking ugly corrupt guy who's like, yeah, gay people killed the president. <laughs> I think just going through the French Quarter with like a wad of bills to get every heroin addict and stew bum to be like, yeah, I saw him. I saw him with Oswald. They even show it during the trial. Yeah, no, yeah we, we should get... Yeah, so well, yeah, wait, Jim before, Garrison, before we get to the actual trial, I want to talk about uh, one other hilarious part in the movie is that like, you know, uh, again, like as, as the case becomes public, uh, you know, of course, Garrison begins to be, you know, slandered in the national press and his reputation is attacked. And this is when his wife, uh, Sissy Spacek, is like, I'm out. I can't deal with this anymore. You care more about Kennedy than you do about your own family. And he's just like, he's like, well, d- divorce me fine, but you just stay asleep forever, honey. Because, you, know, you know, again, women don't like talking about My conspiracy theory. Open. But, yeah. And then almost right after that happens, he sees Robert F. Kennedy get killed on television he wakes up his wife and he goes, honey, they killed his brother. And she goes, oh, no, you were right all along. And then they have sex. <laughs> <laughs> so he and then he lays five star pipe after being like, it's all real. This is not explicitly stated in the movie, but I do believe that from the time Jim Garrison flew on the airplane with his cool Cajun friend with, with Russell Long to the assassination, assassination of RFK, he did not have sex with his wife once. <laughs> it took RFK dying for them to rekindle the flame. So then it gets to, you know, like the, the, the actual climax of the movie. But, you know, it honestly, like the, the, the movie falls, completely falls apart after the Donald Sutherland part. I yeah. mean, it's and still entertaining. It's still entertaining. But like, okay, there is a probably, I think like in, in any movie I can think of, Kevin Costner talks on screen unbroken for longer than like, like almost 20 minutes of just him talking yeah. and advancing the whole case, the magic bullet theory back and to the left. And that, as you pointed out, you, like he lays it out, like how did this bullet like defy the laws of physics to like create all these injuries? And then Matt, you pointed out like they neglected to mention that, that uh, Kennedy's seat was a full like what, five three inches, in, yeah. three inches higher than Connolly's yeah, in the, yeah. the driver and passenger seat. Yeah, they were not on the same plane at all. Also, um, it should be noted, his the trial he's conducting it hinges on the idea that the one gay guy knew another. But yes, that's the, yes, that's the like, entire, that is the entire the worst job. Case. The, the case is he's gay because yeah. that is it. Like the when they they don't connect him in any way to any of these guys because he lays out the whole idea of how the conspiracy happened from the top from the Pentagon, but he makes no attempt to even make a gesture towards connecting Clay Shaw to any of that. All it is is these guys were all gay and knew each other. <laughs> right, right. His entire case is like, well, you knew this other gay guy, right? And then, like, through flashbacks, we know he did in the universe of this movie. But the, the Clay Shaw is like, no, I didn't. And, and, and he's like, well, I'm out of things. So, like, here's... We're going to go in on the Warren Commission. <laughs> he does the worst job as a prosecutor out of anyone who's portrayed as a protagonist. Okay, so as a prosecutor if, in a yeah, movie if you ever. buy everything he says, the most you can say is like, I agree with everything he put forward. He was gay with Lee Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is the entirety of his case, is that he fucked Lee Harvey Oswald, which Marina Oswald also did. She's not on trial. <laughs> <laughs> So, and again, what's so funny is like, you know, this is in a New Orleans courtroom. You got Tommy Lee Jones, like, you know, sitting there, you know, as the defendant. Garrison is presenting his case to, you know, uh, a jury of 12 men, 12 angry, 12 bored men. (laughs) Um, And like, the entire, this is like, this goes on for like a half an hour of him talking. And like, Clay Shaw is not mentioned once. 
And then he's like, and then at the end, he's like, Clay Shaw there. Like the jury's like, wait, who? <laughs> who? <laughs> who's yeah, that again? Wait, oh, what? Guy. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> wait, who's that again? You've been talking for four hours. Okay, so I looked this up. The actual trial of Clay Shaw. <laughs> it took the jury one hour to acquit him. <laughs> To unanimously find him innocent of all charges. <laughs> so they just, just like they made a the gumbo work. and then we're like, yeah, this guy's insane. Well, that was it. Yeah, it's like it could have been shorter, but it's like, hey, if we stretch this, we get a free lunch out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were just eating lunch and being like, Jim Garrison's an asshole. This guy's a fucking moron. And it's done like again, like this is like, you know, uh, to kill a mockingbird, this is like the big courtroom. You know, the crucible, the crucible of truth, you know, it's all laid bare, justice. And he does this whole thing at the end where he's just like, remember your king. Remember your fallen king. Do not let him like. And then there's, there's a brilliant scene where he literally, like Kevin Costner addressing the jury. Do not forget your dying king. Show this world that this is still a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. Nothing as long as you live will ever be more important. It's up to you. And literally makes eye contact directly with the camera yep. and goes, it's up to you. Yep. I'm like, damn, yo, who's he talking to? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, 13-year-old me was like, it is up to me. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Yes. Time, time to get on the forums. <laughs> you have entrusted me with a great mission. I must be responsible now. Yeah, just all the dying, like all the deep state guys were kept alive through adrenochrome warships in 2003 are like, sir, you'll never believe this. A fat 13 year old is posting about this movie, another guy <laughs> made, revealing your role in killing the president. <laughs> And the way he talks about Kennedy in that monologue is embarrassing. He calls, he calls him his, our dying king, and then he says, we are all Hamlets in this country, uh, the children of a slain father leader. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I forgot it's about so that good. part. Because Oliver Stone it's has so a very good. unhealthy relationship with authority figures. But that's like, a, no, that's that, more of yeah, like a that, as you yeah. pointed out, like, but also like masculinity in general. As yeah. if you look at like, uh, like Stone's entire sort of film canon, a big theme of it is sort of like trying to, I don't know, sort of salvage or recreate uh, the classic American masculine archetype yep. in a way that's like good and not bad. Yeah. yeah you know, like, like the guy who went to Vietnam and like is woke. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? He's, like, he's a trad liberal. This is what we have. <laughs> like, this yeah. is, he's like, even though like he's diametrically opposed to like, his message is diametrically opposed to beat boot edge edge, like they. Like he, Oliver Stone kind of walked so that Edge Edge could run. <laughs> like it's, it's the same genus. Like, what if we could have like the 1950s, but it wasn't racist. Uh, we could have masculinity, but it was like cool. Yeah. The mil the military is there, but they're nice. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's the same idea generally. Yeah. So again, uh, Clay Shaw acquitted immediately. <laughs> he was a, what are the easiest like, acquittals? Like, so we were watching this last week. Like the, the courtroom scene is so funny because it's like, damn, Jim, you killing it, <laughs> you know? Jim, you're on fire, dude. <laughs> it's like the worst prosecuted case ever. <laughs> it made like, like again, again. Why is Clay Shaw here? What, what, what exactly is he, he charged he with was again? Gay with Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> he could not have done a worse job prosecuting this case. He could have. It just like I. I and probably not the members of the jury could not remember what they had brought him in on. <laughs> and it's also funny because like uh, uh, Clay, Clay Shaw's attorney is like, I object, I object. Like, you know, and then like the judge is like, stay, you know, you're, you're running around, Mr. Garrison, like stick to the case. And he's like, OK. So then, uh, you know, Bell Helicopter made a contract. But then it's just like, wait, wait you, you can't just do that. Like, right. It's like that judge, like he must have loved Garrison or more likely Garrison like well, that's gave him a golf Garrison club probably membership. Tried to prosecute him for racketeering fraudulently, <laughs> yeah. which he did. Yeah. But that thing Not is that like, judge, but is, other, uh, other is ones. That the judge is portrayed as hostile to Garrison. But then you're like, what judge would allow any of that to happen? Yes. Yeah, so that's like literally only like your friend would let you do that. <laughs> if your friend was the judge and you were the DA and you were like, all right, you mind if I just go in right now, dude? Like that, there's no courtroom where that would be allowed. None. They're like, objection, sustained. And Garrison's like, 
All right, I'm just gonna keep talking. Though. I'm just gonna like keep keep spinning objection this out. Mean, objection means you don't like it, but I can keep going, right? <laughs> but like, not only is the entire case Clay Shaw was gay with Lear Oswald, it was propped up by like they even showed it. Like they have a heroin addicted guy who's like nodding off on the fucking stand, being like, "That's the man who I saw with Oswald." <laughs> Uh, like that's not convincing even to me and at this point i've been watching for two and a half hours and i'm incredibly on your side and it still is it's like i'm like you know what that actually is not much of a case it's like it is he he has a pathetic showing for someone who's literally spent what like seven years working yeah. on this yeah it's a pathetic showing yeah so but the thing is he had to because he wanted to do a movie about the jfk assassination and to do that you need a narrative and there really isn't any because it's just a thing that happened and then we just kind of went that's weird here, the, 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 no matter how much of a screwball or a con artist Garrison was, his trial was an actual thing you could portray on film. Yeah. And so you could p- use it to pump in everything else. And that means you have to sacrifice some reality, like the reality of who Garrison is. You have to turn him into Atticus Finch. And you have to sacrifice some smaller truths for the greater truths of the gay conspiracy to kill the president. <laughs> it's emotionally true. Yeah. And so, like, yeah, okay, he walks out of the courtroom, uh, Clay Shaw is acquitted, the film ends, and then they give you, like, some end cards that, like, are, like, you know, yeah. the Warren Committee, the CIA did admit that they were, had some connection to Clay Shaw, blah, blah, blah. And then in possibly my favorite part of the movie, the last single title card before the credits roll says, this film is dedicated to the youth of America, whose, like, searching spirit for <laughs> truth, like, lives on. I wonder why we were all so blown away why it is children. It's like, that's me, dude. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's up to us, man. It's like, we I did got, it. I'm going to go to fucking Langley and I'm opening those files myself. Should we say like the theory that we concluded on? Okay, that? well, yeah, this is where I want to talk about like overall, like what do we actually think about the JFK assassination? Because again, like there's a lot of insane shit going on His there. His brain that's, did disappear. Yes, from that the is National true. Archive. They went to get it and it was gone. They stole the president's brain. And, you know, like I, the, the, the official story surrounding it, like so many other things in American history, is a conspiracy theory in itself. It's incredible in in the most simple definition of the term. So I think if you were talking about fictional portrayals of the JFK conspiracy and assassination, I think the more credible fictional version of this is advanced in Don DeLillo's Libra, which is basically like a, a novel about the life of Lee Harvey Oswald. Libra Basic, power, baby. It's Libra season. It's, it is Libra season. I won. And, and, and in, I would highly recommend reading it. It's, a, it's a, a fantastic, fantastic novel. And David Ferry, Guy Bannister uh, are all big characters in that book. Um, the conspiracy, like the, 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 the narrative that DeLillo crafts in that, in that book is that, like this, yes, the CIA was involved. The CIA and the mob were involved with it. It was like a CIA operate, like a sort of rogue operation off the books CIA operation that in, you know of which Lee Harvey Oswald was an asset in um, that was blowback from the failed Bay of Pigs invasion and their um, real actual like feeling of extreme anger and betrayal at Kennedy for not doing the air cover or not backing them or not not fully going to the hilt and invading Cuba which yeah. you know they very much wanted to do before Vietnam by the way mm-hmm. like that was like that was their focus is that you know the communist nation 50 miles off the coast of America right but basically is the idea was not that they wanted to assassinate the president what they wanted to do was stage an assassination attempt on Kennedy that could be pinned on someone who actually was a you know a committed Marxist, Marxist with you know pro Castro sympathies. Lee Harvey Oswald was a you know socialist communist. He defected to the Soviet Union and lived there for several years. Um, they wanted to use it as a causus belly to have a second bite at the apple of invading Cuba and overthrowing Castro. But it got out of hand, and they're like, "Oh damn, we killed the president!" <laughs> Snap, right? Which I find more credible. That's in much more knowing everything we know about the CIA and just the world. Like the the cool the cool smug guy thing to say after everything is like usually the answer is incompetence. <laughs> but it's like it can be incompetence and conspiracy and it usually is. Like what well, knowing what you know, couldn't you see the CIA being like, "All right, so like 
we're just going to perfectly miss his head. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Like our plan, here's the plan. And a little, there was a second team of shooters. I think it's, I think Oswald probably did fire those shots from the book depository, but I think it's also, I buy that there was another shooter. Mm -hmm. with the grass. Yeah, you know, yeah, there yeah, were yeah. they like, you know, um, I buy that or at least agnostic on it. Yet I, I'm just imagining the CIA is like, yo, check this out. We're going to shoot his ear off. <laughs> and that'll be like a big yo he, he'll get the picture then and then it's just like oh shit the bullet was a couple inches to the left we blew his fucking head off oh, oh shit fuck. Oh, for, then, oh fuck oh fuck oh yeah, fuck for the next week being like oh fuck oh fuck oh fuck what are we gonna do what are we gonna do what are we gonna do fuck 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 no 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 I know a guy in the mafia he can get this guy with a gun <laughs> uh, 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 there, there's this weirdo club owner who has a lot of dogs and shit everywhere we'll get, he owes us a lot of money he'll just fucking kill a guy um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like that's one hundred percent. So like this idea that it was like, uh, yeah, like uh, they had to kill him to have carry out the squid out. I think it's more likely that it was an intelligence operation that got way out of hand, and they were actually horrified when it turned out they actually blew Kennedy's head off and assassinated the president. That's the, it's the same thing with the Sarnayevs, where it's like people they're like, oh, like there was this un, there was this previously undocumented FBI contact. They it was a false flag. It's like, no, it's not. They were trying to cultivate them as assets, and then they like they like put the phone with their contact in the washing machine. And we're like, <laughs> oh yeah, we never fucking knew them. <laughs> well, yeah. And like, and this is the point is like, um, I believe, and if you like, you know, I believe like, if, if you look at like all the, the facts around Oswald's life and the, like the bizarre inconsistencies and the fact that like everything about the investigation has just bizarre inaccuracies and obvious coverups makes sense when like, I, I totally believe Oswald was, an asset of the agency who was working with Bannister Ferry as like, you know, these cutouts that are sort of like off the books, but still, you know, part of an intelligence operation. Stone in the movie says at one point that Oswald was and, you know, still is up to the date of his death, a military intelligence officer, which is horseshit. Oswald was like a typical fail son, loner, weirdo, didn't fit in everywhere, didn't fit in anywhere, joined the Marines at 17 to glom onto that, and then became a communist to glom onto that as well. But I think, I mean, he certainly was, and I think like the fact that he was let back into the United States after literally defecting, I'm sure was done with the proviso that you are now working for us and that you are now, you know, our, yeah. our cat's paw. I mean, the, it makes sense. And Matt, as you quite really put it out, all of the insane cover up that happened after it makes perfect sense in this theory because if it had turned out that the guy who killed the president was a CIA <laughs> asset, whether they literally said kill the president or not, yeah. and maybe if, even if they didn't, that would be the end of the CIA. Right, yeah. right. And that's what they were covering up. The end of up. the U.S. government, yeah. End of the U.S. government. Like, and like the thing is, like with these conspiracy theories, like this idea that like at the very top, from the top down to like, you know, like kill the president. Yes, the CIA from its very founding has been intimately involved with organized crime. And I would think basically the best way to understand the CIA is organized crime for the American ruling class. Mm -hmm. That is what they do. That is the function that they serve. Yes. Is organized crime for like the original WASP ruling elite of this family who have always had intimate, intimate ties with organized crime in America, Europe, et cetera, right? So like there are all these shady connections or whatever. And like the idea is not and like these assets, these people who are like have feet in both worlds, who are all incredibly scary, violent, unstable, deranged people who are very useful for them for doing things like, you know, killing people, smuggling drugs, assassinations, et cetera, et cetera. Is it like they control everything from the top down? Or like what's actually scary is that like they lose control of these people all the time and then they end up carrying out horrific acts of murder or terrorism and then they're like, oh shit, um, he, 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 he was kind of working for us. Better, better cover that up. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm, mm -hmm. I am profoundly a a agnostic on the whole Kennedy thing because I used to be, after this movie helped spark me and I got deep, deep into it and I was a full-on like, you know, conspiracy guy uh you know <laughs> mob did it what or the cia did it with the mob and all that i had a whole theory worked out you know read american tabloid i'm like yeah i think that's another fantastic novel i uh, highly recommend everyone should read uh, and i was like that's basically what happened but i mean with time I, I think what basically happened is is that i just can't buy kennedy as a threat to power enough to imagine a world where they would have taken the risk of, of trying to do it uh try to kill him like that because you know in a world where they can get away with that. 
they also wouldn't really worry about him. You know, he wouldn't be enough of a threat. Their power would be so entrenched. So I just, because of my inability to accept that Kennedy is a threat, Alexander Coburn actually helped me think that way because he wrote a lot of stuff when this movie came out uh, uh, criticizing it. And his big argument was Kennedy was a Cold War he was He was an establishment figure. That's just absurd to think that he was a threat. And I, I still find that a persuasive point that makes it hard for me to accept any narrative that includes a conspiracy to kill Kennedy coming from the top of the government. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think like a Sarnayev type situation. Is uh, what very good. No, yeah, so I kind of, that's a very yeah. good analog to this is because Tamerlan, uh, I mean, I, we can't say with some certainty, but I think almost certainly was an a gay F- guy. An, yeah. <laughs> All his friends, gay guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, an FBI informant. Yes. And not only yeah. that, to the degree that he killed three people a year before the Boston bombing and the FBI covered it up because yes. he was, of his value to them as an asset. And who was, you know, like a, again, a dangerous, violent psychopath. Yeah. And then like, for whatever reason, I like, I can imagine like a situation where he's just like, he feels like they've turned on him or like they're going to, you know, uh, throw him away or like he's been burned or whatever. And he's just like, fuck it. I'm just going to like blow up the Boston Marathon to show them or get yeah. back at them yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, you know, carry out the actual, you know, thing that they were going to try to get him to pretend to do or some bullshit like that. Yeah. There's no way to know. That's the annoying thing about all this shit. Who um, could say? Ask Oliver folks, Stone to make a movie about it. Folks, who could say? At the end of, the, at the end of it, who can say? Closing thoughts, do we miss any other of the amazing uh, cameos in this film? John Candy. Oh, John yeah, Candy. John Candy, yeah. Who plays like, Dean Andrews? D- Dean Andrews, yes. Uh, a, a, yeah, like another sleazy New Orleans lawyer who was Lee Harvey Oswald's who, lawyer. Who talks like a, like a beatnik. <laughs> He's got the right TT, but the wrong ho-ho. <laughs> Daddy-ho, yeah. Uh, John Candy. There are a few other gems in, in, in this that I'm probably forgetting at the moment. Laurie Metcalf is good. J.O. Sanderson. Chirkoff Sanders is very good. <laughs> Jerk off instruction, Sanders. <laughs> so, yeah, I think like we're all to varying degrees like, yeah, like kind of like living in the sort of like, yeah, the, the historical fiction, the narrative, the world yeah. of Oliver Stone's yes, CFK. The world, the world where there was a, a great crime committed by a shadowy cabal and we're living in the aftermath of it. If you're mixing Adderall and vodka all by yourself on 11 o'clock on a Thursday night, definitely watch JFK. <laughs> go I'm Sandy Kenyon go and see it develop a mania for two weeks and then just go back to your regular life and pretend like you didn't call your uncle on the phone and ask him if you knew David Ferry <laughs> see this movie <laughs> no for real though if you and your homie run smoke, don't walk if you and your homie want to smoke mids and really just like fucking go nuts watch this shit if you want to just take the the mild case of Epstein brain you have and and weaponize it into some sort of you know plague version of it. Watch watch JFK. Are you going through a rough breakup and you just need something to do? Watch it. There you go. That is our review of Oliver Stone's JFK and the Kennedy assassination in general. My one of my favorite movies and one of my favorite assassinations. 